In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. King David was in a high state of glee. And it's completely understandable that David would be gleeful. As the scripture says, the king was settled in his house and the Lord had given him rest from all his enemies around him. Yes, indeed, David had survived all those wars with the Philistines and Israel's other enemies. Just as well, he had survived that bizarre rivalry with King Saul, Saul who alternately adored him and tried to kill him. But there was also the king's son, Jonathan, whom David loved as a bosom friend, passing the love of women, the scripture says. He was the friend whom David lost when Saul and his son, Jonathan, both died in their final battle with the Philistines. Together, they were the father and son family whose loss David lamented in his now classic eulogy, How have the mighty fallen and the weapons of war perished? Nevertheless, in the providence of God, Jonathan's death as the crown prince and the heir to the throne meant that David could begin his reign as the uncontested successor to, to Saul. Thus, this 30-year-old warrior who began life as a shepherd boy had become the most powerful and desired man of his people. Remember, as we heard two Sundays ago in our Old Testament reading, all the tribes of Israel came to David at Hebron and said, look, for some time, while Saul was king over us, it was you who led out Israel in battle and brought it in. The Lord said to you, it is you who shall be shepherd of my people, Israel. You shall be ruler over Israel. Yes, David was understandably in a high state of glee. His people adored him and celebrated along with him his rise to power. Indeed, last Sunday scripture offered verse after verse telling how the people joined their new king as he exulted in ecstasy and at his coronation. The scripture says that David and all the house of Israel were dancing before the Lord with all their might, with songs and lyres and harps and tambourines and castanets and cymbals. And as the ark of the Lord came into the city of David, one saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord. It's as if the scripture itself is swooning all over David and can't get enough of telling how he himself and his people rejoiced over his ascension to the throne. But notice here the two key words, house and shepherd. That is, all the house of Israel rejoicing with David on the one hand, and also a few verses, all the tribes of Israel coming to him and saying, the Lord said, you shall be shepherd over Israel. So those are my two key words for this Sunday's readings, house and shepherd. Because in today's readings, we find the same two words, the same words highlighted. In the first reading, David wants to build a house or temple for God. And in the gospel reading, Jesus is described as having compassion for crowds because they were like sheep without a shepherd. But I need to offer one more image before we explore further these two words as key themes for this Sunday. In fact, I need to ask you to indulge me in a little humor. I promise it'll have some bearing on our themes for today. That is, I hope you agree that it will have some bearing on our themes for today. 
And anyhow, as your preacher, I'm going to wager with a little gamble that humor can apply here. And it's only a small bet, but the stakes may be fairly high if you came here today to hear the gospel good news. Let's see what you think. Some levity seems appropriate because of David's glee at becoming the darling young king of his people with everything going his way and even the scriptures gushing all over him. There's such a festive, upbeat spirit here. Let's see if a little levity can join it. Consider the joke about a snail riding on the back of a turtle. That's right. It's a ridiculous image, but I think it fits the dynamics we're about to describe. What does a snail say when it's riding on the back of a turtle? Indulge the image for a moment. The contrast in speed is exhilarating. So the snail says as it's riding on the back of a turtle, whee! That's right. Whee! Yes, going so fast compared to what it's used to. Feels like it's flying. It's understandable that it says whee as it experiences the contrast. Likewise, the glee of David riding the wave of his people's adulation and esteem is a kind of whee by comparison well, by comparison with what? By comparison with the contrasting development that we discover in today's Old Testament lesson, when the prophet Nathan comes to David and tells him what God thinks about his gleeful desire to build God's first temple in David's new city. Thus says the Lord, the prophet declares to David, and notice in what follows the repeat appearances of themes of house building and shepherding. Thus says the Lord, are you the one to build me a house to live in? I have not lived in a house since the day I brought up the people of Israel out of Egypt to this day, but I have been moving about in a tent and a tabernacle. Wherever I have moved, did I ever speak a word with any of the tribal leaders of Israel whom I commanded to shepherd my people, saying, why have you not built me a house of cedar? And now notice the combined themes of house building with shepherding as God says to David, I took you from the pasture, from following the sheep, to be prince over my people Israel. And I have been with you wherever you went, I will make for you a great name like the name of the great ones of the earth so that when your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your ancestors, I will raise up your offspring after you who shall come forth from your body and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Right here we encounter our key themes for today, both shepherding people and house building. But I hope you also heard the expectation that the kings of Israel, serving as shepherds in the line of David, are meant to be an everlasting dynasty, dynasty beginning with the house of David. I want to say more about that in a minute. But to go from the sublime back to the ridiculous, notice that God building a dynastic house for David makes David riding on the adulation of his people like a snail riding on the back of a turtle. God is saying, I'm gonna build a dynasty for you that will be far more than the house of cedar that you could build. So David wanting to build God a house or temple is infinitely slow by comparison with God putting David on the more awesome track of becoming a royal house that will endure forever. That's what we hear in today's psalm when the psalmist testifies as if it were God saying to David, 
I will establish your line forever and your throne as long as the heavens endure. Once and for all I have sworn by my holiness I will not lie to you. Your line shall continue forever and your throne endure before me like the sun. It shall be established forever like the moon, the enduring witness in the sky. Now we Christians have for centuries, millennia, going on millennia now, understood this as a prophecy of the enduring dynasty of David to be fulfilled in the person of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in Jesus as the Messiah descended from the house of David. But today's gospel also depicts Jesus as one who had compassion for crowds because they were like sheep without a shepherd. So here we have both our key themes of house building and people shepherding converging in Jesus as the Davidic Messiah. This is what the house, the dynasty is meant to do, to shepherd crowds, masses, all of us, all the human family, with Jesus as the good shepherd who fulfills the dynastic call of the kings of Israel to be shepherds of people fulfills what the flawed and failed kings of Israel were never able to completely achieve. And precisely here, church family, we enter into this, into this project, this great dynastic project of a providential God. Because we are challenged to do more than simply read scriptures every Sunday or sing hymns or celebrate, uh, celebrate the sacraments. We're challenged to do more and called to do more than marvel at the fulfillment of prophecies. Rather, as in our epistle today, we are called and exhorted to ourselves become that living temple, a house for God better than the material temples that David wanted to build or his son Solomon finally built. Ephesians says it this way, as you heard the lector read it, you are citizens with the saints and also members of the household of God, built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, with Christ Jesus himself as the cornerstone. In him the whole structure is joined together and grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are built together spiritually into a dwelling place for God. That's right. That's our high calling. And how precisely are we built to be the spiritual house of God? Ephesians talks about this in the context of the hostility and rivalry and conflict between Jewish Christians and Gentile Christians and announces that the Gentiles were at one time without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise. It says, having no hope and without God in the world in a way that is reminiscent of our Lord looking on the crowds and seeing them as sheep without a shepherd. But Ephesians goes on to say, but now in Christ Jesus, you who once were afar off have been brought near by the blood of Christ, for he is our peace, and in his flesh he's broken down the dividing wall that is the hostility between us, that he might create in himself one new humanity, thus making peace through the cross, putting to death that hostility through it. So he came and proclaimed peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near. For through him we have access in one spirit to the Father. Christian friends, what are we to say who have such a high calling? We are called to be reconciled to both enemies and friends in the dynastic house built by our great shepherd in the house of Jesus as the good shepherd of the sheep. What are we to say to such awesome themes, such majestic opportunities and life-giving challenges? Opportunities and challenges such as St. Francis envisioned when he said, where there is hatred, let us sow love. In our own time, we have such opportunities and challenges to create beloved community 
in the face of hostility and hatred. As representatives of our Good Shepherd, we are called to shepherd crowds who wander about and who act out hostility against others and ourselves like sheep without a shepherd. We have opportunities and challenges that require our best energies and our most creative wits as to how to both protect those we love and defend against the incursions of our enemies and at the same time reach out to reconcile with our enemies and to convert them, transform them into friends. As Abraham Lincoln famously said, do I not destroy my enemies by making them my friends? What else is there to say in the context of such great challenges and opportunities? Well, we could be gleeful. That's right. We could say, we, we, we have entered upon the project of the ages with one who has gone before us about whom the great uh, Messiah opera says, the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. This good news of the gospel of Christ, of beloved community, spread abroad in the world, is also ours to continue to convey and to represent in all that we do and undertake. We could be gleeful about it. We are challenged to have the exhilaration of the speed of God transporting us beyond anything we could have achieved on our own, in our own power and in our own strength. That's our challenge. I invite you to join the church and the apostles and prophets in achieving it in our own time. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen.